So our final talk of the day, until the lightning talks, is Mike O'Connor. Uh, Mike has spoken at previous mini comps about his project Clockwork, which he has now been working on porting to the ESP32. So I'm really interested to see how this works. Thank you, Mike. So thank you. Um, as mentioned, uh, I've spoken about Clockwork uh, at a me conf in the past and probably to a lot of people here have probably heard me talk about it. I'm fairly uh, uh, <laughs> uh, talkative about it. But uh, um, this project uh, was uh, started about a month ago and uh, the idea was to uh, advance clockwork from being an interpreted language down to uh, uh, being C and then compilable onto uh, a micro and of course eventually back onto our own stuff because that would increase the performance of it. And so um, we liked the idea of free RTOS um, and the ESP32 has that as its base platform. Even when you're running an Arduino based system, it's actually running free RTOS as basically a task. Uh, free RTOS is an, an Arduino is a task on that hardware. Um, we have got some distance and I'll get to that soon, but we wanted to support all of our normal tools. We have a tool called Scope that allows us to see into the processing as it's happening. Uh, we have a command line sort of in, uh, interrogation tool called IOSH and uh, in the last uh, six months we've implemented a OpenGL based um, uh, HMI, Human uh, Machine Interface, which we call Humid. Um, which is uh, also a text-based configuration system uh, which uh, uses a fairly, uh, very much like Clockwork's own configuration language to make it work. Um, so um, our uh, implementation steps were to um, get a Clockwork runtime on FreeRTOS. Um, which was interesting because our base platform is actually C++ using Boost. So uh, there was basically a complete rewrite of that system done. Uh, we wrote some simple uh, test programs um, that would be in C but were equivalent of what you would have written in Clockwork uh, so that we could see how hard that was to be done, or how hard it would be. And uh, uh, then um, we had to go through and um, build the uh, the building objects, which is like um, wait and set um, our when rules. And so you can see here uh, under um, the when rules, that's uh, a template of a machine. We call each uh, state machine um, a machine, and that's a template. And so you can instantiate that one or 50 times. And uh, um, we, I'll show you later that program running in Clockwork uh, interpreted and then having been manually compiled into uh, C and then onto the Arduino, uh, onto the ESP32. Um, we, we would like to also implement all of the fairly more, much more complicated functionalities. We have the ability to have lists which we can select objects out of based on their properties. We can sort them. We can do all sorts of very powerful uh, data manipulation um, uh, things which we need for our own machinery and, uh, and, the, and we have actually implemented it like a database interface into Clockwork using MySQL for one of my own projects. Uh, we have, uh, I did show this last time, uh, the MQTT interface um, is available uh, within Clockwork and uh, once implemented would be available to um, uh, this system. Uh, the Humid system is available at uh, um, that GitHub address just below. Um, and here's an example of using Clockwork um, uh, against uh, an MQTT. Uh, and uh, once implemented, this would be the same um, uh, language uh, that we would use to talk to, uh, on an ESP32. So you basically tell it where its broker is. Uh, in between the, the, that, IP, that IP address, you can actually put some brackets and inside there you can put username and passwords and maybe a, a secret um, identifier or whatever is used uh, in that particular broker. Uh, you can attach points basically to a topic 
and in the case of a point, it's an on and off type thing. And in the case of um, uh, an analog, we, we've set them up as what we call an MQQT subscriber. And that can be any arbitrary data set uh, is available inside that. And then uh, just below there is a bit of an example of a, how you would instantiate a, um, you know, a sensor for uh, a detecting the light level, which you might then have another machine that might turn the lights on. And if it's once the level gets below a certain level in a, in a, in a house or something like that. Um, you know, once you've written that sensor, once you've written the piece of logic relating to how you might turn the lights on and off, and you've got 50 of those in your home, it's just two or three lines of instantiation, and you now have your house, all of those lights working. The same with, of course, um, switches in a home or whatever. It, it becomes very simple to implement it. And of course, you can do local logic as well as remote logic very easily, which uh, uh, can be quite useful. Um, so where do we get to? Um, we had the basic runtime running, which can run multiple clockwork tasks. Um, we're able to read and write uh, GPO, which is a single bit of data in or out. Um, we have a partial framework for reading and writing analog values. Um, and we are currently working on the generators to convert the runtime to, to C. Uh, and uh, that is the um, location where the work is being done currently. Um, I have a bit of a demo. Um, so this is that Pulse program that uh, was on the, on the, in the notes. Um, it's just a single copy of it. Um, I can run that and you can see that it's pulsing on and off. That's nice, but that doesn't, that's because I've got the log statement. Well, what we want to do now is run a, a sampler and now we can see a sample of that data being as it processes, but of course we might want to interrogate something more complicated than that. So we can uh, list out all the machines. Uh, I can find a, a type of machine called Pulse and see what its current status is. I can describe that machine. And so this gives us all of the internal data about that machine. Um, how, how long ago it was evaluated um, because it's event driven but uh, you can see how long it was evaluated. So it's in the, currently in the off state, it's been in that state for 38.2 milliseconds. We can actually use that information uh, to, uh, every state has a timer and so you can use that. When you're on the on state you can say 15 minutes from now leave the on state. So you can turn lights off just like that, that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's the basic idea there. Um, and we have other things like we can actually run that. Uh, we just want to know the pulse. And so we now only get the pulse. Um, you can do it with that grep, but because of the way grep uh, does its uh, it's buffering, you, you sort of become delayed. So we have a special version that understands how to do these things a bit better. We can also, um, the human platform is actually able to use this data and do full-blown graphing. And uh, example, I just finished him, uh, one of our sampling lines off and uh, I had serious problems with the hydraulic control and uh, um, I couldn't work it out. And so we implemented the, um, the humid ability to do graphing and literally within two hours I'd identified what I'd got wrong and got it fixed. Uh, it's, uh, um, the last speaker mentioned uh, it's uh, very important to have the ability to actually see into things and see how, what's going on <laughs> in a real and effective way and that uh, the, this ability to get that kind of information it makes for a very powerful platform. Um, so where am I? There. So this is uh, uh, and actually, no, I wanted to show you the, uh, so, uh, yeah. So this EX1 file here um, is a implementation of the Pulse machine as C code. Um, and we're able to take the information eventually that's appearing in our config files and, and our state machine 
documentation and generate this C code uh, from that reasonably easily. Uh, it's just that uh, we never actually got there. So this here is the uh, pulse create uh, structure. This is the pulse check state. So this is where all those when statements would be looked at and can work out what state it's meant to be in. Um, and down here is your init for pulse and then the pulse underscore enter. That was the state that was actually turning on the output um, and then turning it off again. So, uh, yeah, so anyhow, so we make flash um, and hopefully we can make this thing see that. I've got no idea how to do this. Uh, no, I don't know how to work this. Um, but anyhow, we do the make flash and uh, that's loading. Um, oh, okay. That's the, that's the, <laughs> the, um, as part of the flashing uh, that had, um, okay. I still got left in the state, has it? Yeah, anyhow. So there's a flashing light here, the little bit on the, uh, on there uh, is the flashing pulse that was appearing from there. How do I stop that? Maybe, no? That's probably the simplest. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> so that had micro uh, micro Python on it there, so that I could actually you know, show that the flashing light went through. Um, so I thought I would just try to quickly show this last project that we um, implemented. Um, this here uh, is. Um, uh, the humid display uh, that is showing uh, bales of wool that have been, uh, the pictures are captured early in the machine and as they move through you'll actually see these pictures move uh, and you can see the weight of the bale and uh, uh, that kind of thing. This is, as I say, fully open jewel. The reason why we went and developed it prob mostly is because the commercially available tools won't allow you to open an arbitrary file as an image or a URL as an image and I wanted to be able to get these pictures I captured and display them on the screen. <laughs> so that was the main impetus for it, but it actually made for a very quick development, whereas uh, the old Windows-based SCADA platforms are a nightmare for writing code in because you can't version control them. This here, the gentleman's, um, they've loaded the bale uh, incorrectly. It's actually the wrong way out, so you can't see the cap. So what he's doing is saying it's three bales and he's actually zeroing out the cores and grabs because they're not allowed to grab and core it when it's the wrong way around. And this allows you to automatically remove a set of bales from the machine. Um, and so, yeah, that's uh, what he's doing there. Again, the other thing, we didn't go for, even when we designed it for a touch screen, we didn't go for a touch screen because these go out into remote locations and touch screens die. <laughs> And when they die, what does the person do? This is a ch fairly cheap monitor that they could go down to, probably not the local computer store because it probably doesn't exist anymore, but somewhere close and purchase a new set of screens, keyboards, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's um, an interesting thing there. And then we also had, uh, where do I put that? That's I think here, um, yeah, here. This here is an overview screen. Um, that the uh, that in wool testing there's a requirement for a, a representative of the testing lab to be on site while they're doing the coring and this lady here is that's her job she takes the sample bags from this side and she monitors the operation of the machine and so this is an overview screen that allows her to see what bales are being processed right now and all that kind of thing this is all controlled by clockwork there's uh, four Linux computers in this machine uh, two running, one for each part of the machine, so the core and the grab, and then two display computers. Um, they're basically uh, in Intel Atom NUCs on the front end and, and uh, single core ones, and the, the, uh, the back end ones are four, six Ethernet, um, uh, four core Atom NUCs um, uh, doing the control work. Um, and we're able to get to them remotely and do all the diagnostics and tell them what's going on. So yeah, um, that's basically it. I've, as always, I've gone through it rather quickly. <laughs> uh, if there's any questions, I'd be welcome for them. <laughs>